Luke Mekic is calling for a $65 million Bitcoin. Luke is the nine to five escape artist who spent a year in El Salvador, host of the Money Matters and Fix the Money, Fix the World YouTube channels. Thinks a pivot will crash the markets. Luke talks a very compelling argument for why we could be entering a Bitcoin super cycle. Luke, this is such a pleasure to have you here. May we get a brief introduction on who you are and what you're about, mate? Yeah, so firstly, thank you so much for having me. I'm absolutely pumped to be here on your show. Um, so if, essentially, I'm just a Bitcoiner. Uh, I, my full-time job is just helping educate people about Bitcoin. Uh, like you say, I host a couple of different YouTube channels, one of those being for a Bitcoin-only educational company, CoinBeast. Um, and I do a lot of writing about Bitcoin. I'm publishing my first book about Bitcoin. Uh, 26 years old right now, and I'm a digital nomad, just uh, living the dream, talking to Bitcoiners all around the world. Awesome, Luke. I've put a whole lot of your links below in the description. We can jump into those uh, a little bit later in the video. What I want to talk about is definitely the $65 million Bitcoin, the world mm. coin that came out yesterday, the BRICS summit that finished yesterday. But first, what's the simplest way that you would explain Bitcoin's value to someone who thinks it's still magic internet money? Yeah, so I think Bitcoin is the only asset on the earth that you can actually own in, without any counterparty risk. Uh, so firstly, if you're holding cash uh, under your mattress or physical gold and silver, yeah, sure, you might think you don't have any counterparty risk, but you're not immune from a central banker printing a whole lot of freshly printed fiat. So despite your money being under a mattress, you could still technically be stolen from through inflation. The same thing with gold, silver, platinum, or any precious metals that you think you hold in your own self custody somebody could go out there and find a heap of new gold, silver, or platinum uh, just via mining it, and they're going to dilute your supply. Uh, so Bitcoin is the first asset without counterparty risk. I can hold my Bitcoin for 100 years, pass it on to my great-grandchildren, and they will still own X percent of the total 21 million Bitcoin supply. Um, so, so I believe like that kind of uh, that's one core feature of why Bitcoin is so valuable. It's the only asset you own and it's the first asset in human history that has a finite supply. And we have 5,000 years of monetary history showing us that all value tends to one. Money is a winner take all game and Bitcoin is simply the best money in the digital age. So WorldCoin, uh, you've put out a tweet yesterday with a little bit of an um, advert for WorldCoin. Can you tell us what it is and maybe why it is or isn't a good thing for society at large? Yes, yeah, so WorldCoin is a pre-mined cryptocurrency. And most people would be familiar with one of the co-founders, Sam Altman. Uh, so he is the CEO of WorldCoin and he is also the CEO of ChatGPT, which is obviously the fastest growing application to reach 1 million and 100 million users in human history. Everybody's talking about artificial intelligence and it's all because of this one application, ChatGPT. Uh, so Sam Altman's obviously doing some other interesting things in the cryptocurrency space. He's created this altcoin called WorldCoin and essentially uh, it's kind of trying to market itself as an improvement on Bitcoin. So in their uh, one of their investor videos they put out last year, they said, yeah, only the rich people hold Bitcoin. So we, we are coming up with a solution called WorldCoin. And what it's doing is it has this like biometric uh, eye scanning technology. They actually call it the orb. And it's like this really creepy dystopian looking round <laughs> circle, like a big brother eyeball. And uh, they take it around to all these town centers around the world. And uh, what they do is they tell people, if you scan your eyeball and give us your biometric data, we're going to give you a equal quote unquote amount of our world coin supply. Uh, so obviously it's not an equal amount because the founders pre-mine themselves a heap of the tokens. Uh, but this is the marketing that they're trying to use. And I think it's absolutely scary for personal sovereignty and freedom in the digital age and this is just another uh, step towards totalitarian uh, totalitarianism um, and obviously we have CBDCs and social credit scores we have all of these things hurtling towards us and Worldcoin is just another uh, attempt at uh, this kind of really dystopian future our technocratic elite are trying to uh, imprison us with. Yep. And what's the incentive for somebody to go to one of those orbs and scan their face? Why would somebody just go and do that? Are they getting something out of it? Are they getting free world coin? And what can they do with this world coin once they have it? I actually haven't dived too deep down the rabbit hole. I would assume it's just the free world coin uh, that they get for yeah. scanning their eyeball. Obviously, if you're given your biometric data, 
And then you're moving those coins about. They know where it's come from originally mm. as well. So a very easy way to be able to track the population. Uh, two weeks ago, Luke, you put out a really amazing video in regards to the BRICS Summit, uh, which is finished yesterday. And you're talking about both gold and Bitcoin in relation to that. Uh, if you can just dive in, you've really dived into the BRICS rabbit hole. What your thoughts are with all of it? Yeah, so the BRICS, for anyone who doesn't know, it's uh, five countries. So Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Um, and they have only been a like, five-country coalition for the past 14 years. They were established, I think it was just after the 2008 global financial crisis. And they were essentially saying, look, we're kind of done with this US dollar, petrodollar system. Uh, we think it's unfair that the US bailed out all of their banks in the GFC. Uh, so since then, it's just been those five countries. And in their 2022 BRICS uh, summit, they have one annually uh, every year. They've had one for 14 years. They actually announced they're going to create a new global reserve currency. And that was obviously very interesting because 2022 was the year that Russia got kicked off the SWIFT system and had their treasury reserves frozen by the US for invading Ukraine. And since that announcement of the 2022 BRICS summit exactly one year ago, we've had, a, I think it's over 15 or 20 different countries from all around the world world actually show interest or formally apply to become a part of this five country BRICS coalition. So you've got countries like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Iran, Turkey, countries all around the world. And they're not really small countries. There's a few uh, heavy hitters in there. Uh, so uh, naturally, everybody's kind of been speculating, what is this new BRICS uh, currency going to be backed by? Recently, we heard some rumors that it might be backed uh, by gold. Um, I also find it interesting that a few of the BRICS uh, member countries are actually very interested in Bitcoin, either overtly um, or, you know, uh, quietly in the background. So, uh, yeah, the BRICS Summit is something really interesting and something I keep an eye on as we have all of this talk surrounding the de-dollarization movement uh, escalating in recent years. Awesome. So with the BRICS uh, meeting finishing yesterday, have we got any like press releases since that? What What's come out of it? Are they choosing a Bitcoin standard? Are they going to go with gold or we still need to wait to get that information from what's been discussed? I honestly haven't had the time to even pay attention to it, to be quite right. honest with you. I am planning to do a video on, on Sunday, though, so I better start uh, putting my skates on. But I haven't heard any concrete uh, uh, talk that's actually uh, come out of there. Cool. For everyone watching Luke's channels below, that video will already be out by the time you're watching this. So enjoy that. And I can't wait to look <laughs> through that as well. All right. A couple of uh, sort of rapid fire topics is hyper Bitcoinization. What is it? What's it mean? And are we experiencing it or are we going to experience hyper Bitcoinization? A good friend of mine, uh, CK Snarks, uh, says we're already living in hyper Bitcoinization. And that's a world where uh, the entire world is operating on a Bitcoin standard. Um, so I actually think it's a lot closer than most people believe. Um, and I think uh, we could be seeing it uh, even in the 2020s. Interesting. Awesome. I guess that leads us. Let's talk about uh, the Bitcoin super cycle. $65 million price per Bitcoin seems outrageous to probably everybody watching, but you've got a pretty compelling argument. You've done the math on it. So do you want to dive into the $65 million price target for per Bitcoin? Yes, yeah, so first I'm going to do the maths uh, for my outlandish uh, Bitcoin price target, and then I'm going to explain why it's bearish, and then I might explain why I believe it could happen in the 2020s. So firstly, the maths of Bitcoin, uh, you know, most if you look around the world, there's $900 trillion of wealth in the world. If you add up uh, all of the debt, uh, all of the savings, all of the fiat, um, all of the paper promises, it's around $900 trillion. I actually exclude the $2.1 quadrillion of derivatives because I want to try to remain a little bit grounded and a little bit conservative. But if you look at that total amount of money, and I pretend to be conservative, okay? I actually think what happens if Bitcoin captures half of that $900 trillion? We all believe that we're transitioning to, you know, a Bitcoin standard in the future. If we do live in that scenario, wouldn't it make sense that Bitcoin captures half of the world's wealth? I mean, so many of the asset classes uh, that we see around the world today are in a bubble. And that's because uh, we live in this fiat era where nobody can actually store value in money. So I say, okay, Bitcoin can capture half of that. That means there's $450 trillion of potential demand coming in for Bitcoin. And this is where everybody does their Bitcoin maths calculations wrong. They just assume that if there's $450 trillion of demand, that means the Bitcoin market cap is going to be $450 trillion. And this is where people need to consider the Bitcoin multiplier effect. 
Because if you look uh, at the past five years of data, for every $1 that tries to actually flow into Bitcoin, it actually pushes the Bitcoin market cap up by 2.6x. So again, this is a hypothetical scenario. If we are living on a Bitcoin standard, if Bitcoin does capture half the world's wealth, all of a sudden you need to actually add a 2.6x multiplier on top of that hypothetical $450 trillion of demand. And that actually uh, brings you out at a price point of around 64 million dollars uh, per bitcoin and wouldn't it be good to see for everyone watching i think it sounds pretty exciting how realistic do you think that could be we've seen very large companies like microstrategy put bitcoin on their books countries like el salvador you live there for a year they've got it as legal tender we are seeing countries add it as a reserve asset as well so do you think we are is the world already moving in that direction and it'll just be slowly then suddenly or does the math just work out and it's a pretty compelling story to be able to tell ourselves? So I think the math is absolutely inevitable. The only question for in my mind is timeframes. Is it going to take seven years like I believe it could? I think it could happen before 2030 or is it going to be like a 30 or 40 year journey to get there? Um, that's probably the consensus view amongst a lot of Bitcoiners. And I always get into some really interesting debates telling people why they're uber bearish on Bitcoin. But I believe we actually are living in the suddenly phase. I believe that if you look at Bitcoin's 14 year history, I believe the years between 2008 and 2020, they were technically the gradually phase. Think about the people who were buying Bitcoin in those first 12 years of its life. 99.9% .9 of people were just retail speculators. They didn't understand what Bitcoin was. And you can even see this data that actually reflects this narrative that maybe we can get into a bit later. But I believe that since 2020, all of a sudden, uh, an inflection point has actually been reached. And for the first time in Bitcoin's life, we have public companies like uh, Michael Saylor with MicroStrategy buying Bitcoin. We have nation states like El Salvador buying Bitcoin and adopting Bitcoin. And now we have the world's largest asset managers all endorsing Bitcoin. I think since BlackRock uh, announced their plans for a Bitcoin uh, spot ETF, another 12 banks and they're 12, then they're actually 12 of uh, the largest banks and money managers in the world have all announced that they are also filing for a Bitcoin ETF or they are trying to offer custody solutions uh, to try to actually uh, give their clients Bitcoin access. So, uh, so I believe out of the top 20 money managers, they control $50 trillion of assets. 12 of them flip bullish on Bitcoin in the past three weeks. So the, the picture I'm trying to paint here is Things are happening very, very rapidly since 2020. And I believe we are actually in uh, the second phase of Bitcoin's adoption curve, where we kind of are in that suddenly phase. And we haven't even started talking about the fact uh, of how uh, exponentially fragile um, the current fiat legacy system is. But I'll pause there for a minute because I know I uh, just fired a lot at you. Maybe we should lead straight into what you think is the Bitcoin milkshake theory mm -hmm. and how that can suck up all this value here. And that may allow people to wrap their heads around some of these large numbers and the, the movements of Bitcoin. Yeah, so the Bitcoin milkshake theory was actually my attempt at explaining why the United States is actually incentivized to adopt Bitcoin. And when I say this to most people, they start pulling their hair out and calling me crazy because <laughs> people think if Bitcoin is going to be the next global reserve currency, this has to be bad for the United States because they currently have the global reserve currency. Uh, but I don't believe that's the case and this is why. So um, all around the world, uh, the US dollar is the current global reserve currency. And most people who are interested in macroeconomics might have heard of a thesis called the dollar milkshake thesis. And that just simply explains that the US dollar is going to be the last currency to hyperinflate. And that is because there is a lot of external demand for the US dollar all around the world. And that's because countries right now are denominating their oil in US dollars. 90% uh, of the global debt markets are denominated in US dollars. Uh, the US dollar still accounts for something like 50 to 60% of global trade, and it's still in more than 40% of uh, global treasury reserves. So yes, I understand there's a de-dollarization movement going on. We talked about it earlier with the BRICS, uh, but the 
the facts are the US dollar is still the king. And that means it's going to be the last to hyperinflate in what I believe uh, is uh, going to be a global wave of sovereign debt crises and, uh, uh, you know, blow ups of currencies all around the world. Um, and in this, you know, hypothetical situation, eventually people are going to start dumping their US dollar debt. Not eventually, they have been for 20 years. The trend is uh, less, less US dollars all around the world. Countries are buying uh, gold. Um, but I believe that the the way the United States can actually hold on to this global reserve currency longer than most people expect is they need to pull an economic wild card out of their hat. So we have these 20 countries applying to become a part of the BRICS. The BRICS are talking about trying to back their currency by gold. If we see a gold-backed BRICS currency, maybe that is more popular than a paper-backed US dollar. So I have a thesis that the US dollar is going to actually be forced to uh, back its US dollar by Bitcoin. And it's interesting, I've had this thesis for many years. I wrote about it in 2022. It's just funny the timing of our chat because this week RFK came out and said, uh, he wants to actually back yeah. the US dollar by Bitcoin. So the timing is very, very interesting. But uh, you see, this is the last, uh, you know, kind of rabbit in the hat that the US can actually pull to retain faith in the US dollar. Like a gold-backed bricks versus paper-backed dollar, people are going to choose gold-backed bricks. Uh, but all of a sudden, the only way that the US can make their currency more attractive uh, than the BRICS uh, is by backing it with Bitcoin. And it's really interesting that uh, by actually creating this scenario that we're watching today uh, with the US raising rates faster than anybody's ever raised them uh, in 50 years at least since Volcker, all of a sudden it's created a wave of uh, really, really strong inflation around the world. So Argentina, Turkey, Sri Lanka, they've got inflation above 100%. And what happens when your local currency starts to hyperinflate and lose a lot of value? People demand harder assets. So people demand gold, people demand Bitcoin, but the, uh, the US dollar is actually very popular in a lot of these countries. And it's really interesting that countries like Argentina are actually uh, like uh, they're, they're demanding a lot of these US dollar stable coins like tethers, for example. Um, and then obviously you've got countries like Georgia and you've got countries like Switzerland with a city called Laguano who are also making USD tether uh, a de facto legal tender or accepted trade within its regions. And I find it really interesting that if you look at all of the stable coins around the world, uh, over 90% of the volume is actually directly backed by US Treasury government debt. So USDC, Circle, they're 100% backed by US government debt. And then obviously we have Tether. A lot of people have speculated for years that Teva is unbacked. They're holding risky commercial debt. You know, they're rehypothecating, uh, you know, shares and all of this stuff. But they actually have been selling a lot of their riskier assets over the past 12 months. And they've been buying a lot of US government debt. Um, and they've actually bought so much debt that they're actually profitable today. So Teva's actually making like $100 million of profit every month because of all the debt that they have on their balance sheets, because interest rates are higher. So their short dated debt is actually making profit and they're buying $100 million of Bitcoin every month. So that's a really long way of saying that if 90% of the stable coins around the world are directly backed by US government debt, that means the US government actually has an incentive to increase the adoption of stable coins around the world. So how do you do that? You aggressively raise interest rates faster than you have in history. You cause a US dollar shortage around the world. You hyperinflate currencies all around the world. And when those countries have the hyperinflated currencies, they're going to de demand a harder asset. Yes, they're going to uh, adopt Bitcoin, but they're also going to look for uh, US dollar stable coins. And if they're backed by US government debt, all of a sudden the US government has actually found a sugar daddy um, to uh, solve or solve the unwinding of the US petrodollar system. So that's what I call the Bitcoin milkshake theory. How interesting. So do you think with USDC, USDT, that because they come out so publicly against it, they really don't like these stable coins floating around. But from what you're saying, it sounds like maybe behind the scenes, they're actually okay with people flocking to the stable coins and it's just propaganda to say, no, they're bad, but they are intentionally pushing people towards them. Well, this rabbit hole is really deep. Because I actually think the government's been relatively 
uh, favorable or at least lukewarm to uh, USDC and Tether. Uh, the government has absolutely attacked other stable coins that aren't backed by US government debt. So it's really interesting. FTX, uh, obvious example. Luna, an obviously uh, obvious example. A lot of people say that uh, we don't actually know who attacked the UST stablecoin on Luna when that de-pegged, but that wasn't backed by US government debt. Uh, Make a DAO. Um, I don't want to say too much online because there's a really strange story surrounding the uh, CEO of Make a DAO uh, who uh, tragically passed away this year. But I would encourage the listener to uh, look into that story because there's some really strange timings, especially with some of the really interesting things he said on Twitter publicly a day before he was uh, died. Let's just say he died. So, uh, so all of these uh, companies that are kind of like pushing for stable coins that aren't backed by U.S. government debt, uh, they either uh, they either have their peg attacked or they get attacked. Um, so there's some really strange things going on there, and I personally think uh, that maybe Tether was tapped on the shoulder and they said. Uh, look, we know you're too big. We know you're too offshore. We can't ban you because the government's attacked Teva for years. That's not, nobody's disputing that, but they haven't been able to squash Teva. So I, I yeah. speculate in that maybe someone tapped them on the shoulder and said, hey, start backing your, your uh, Tether by US government debt and we'll let you do what you want. How interesting. It'd be, <clears throat> let me start that again. So to be able to look back in a couple of years with hindsight and to see what is actually happening is going to be an interesting story and probably the for your book, I know you're writing one at the moment, maybe that will fill up a whole other book uh, there as well. So <laughs> it's really crazy to see what is happening, especially with like BlackRock. I'd like to dive into that. But before we do, the video that Greenpeace put out last week, um, it sounds like and maybe you'd be able to correct me if i'm wrong but ripple xrp paid five million dollars to greenpeace to put out this propaganda campaign against bitcoin energy mining and the video is designed to incite fear by the way that they've edited the mm -hmm. music they used and stuff it's really not something pleasant to watch and it is totally propaganda can you dive into what you think is going on there, especially between Greenpeace, XRP, and maybe at a larger scale with Bitcoin? Yeah, so at an even larger scale, we can mention BlackRock. Uh, because BlackRock for years has obviously been the largest ESG uh, asset manager. And we've had all of these institutions like the World Economic Forum and BlackRock try to demonize Bitcoin for the fact it uses energy. And anybody knows that, yes, that's true. Bitcoin uses a lot of energy. But if you're going to claim it uses a lot of energy, you have to also, you know, uh, state the fact that over 60% of the energy Bitcoin uses comes from renewable energy sources. So Bitcoin is actually a green machine, as Swan Bitcoin puts it. They are actually the greenest country, corporation, or individual on the face of the planet. Um, so I mean, yes, it's strange that we have these institutions attacking Bitcoin as proof of work mining. Uh, I did see that video that went out recently by Greenpeace, and it was really strange and really interesting. Um, and in a recent video, I kind of connected some dots and said, hey, it's really strange that uh, BlackRock uh, is actually on the board of directors for the World Economic Forum. That is the same World Economic Forum who has publicly endorsed Ethereum and has a member of the World Economic Forum on the board of the Ethereum Foundation. Um, so we mm. have these, yeah, really strange connections wow. there between BlackRock ethereum which is obviously proof of stake and then obviously if you have a look at greenpeace uh who got paid five million dollars by chris larson guess who else was on the uh guess who else has ties to the world economic forum chris larson chris larson is part of the wef and so is ripple his company that he founded so when you connect all of these dots it all of the dots lead back to the world economic forum and they all suggest that, uh, you know, all of a sudden that narrative that is coming out of the World Economic Forum begins to make more sense because they've demonized anything that uses energy. So it's not just Bitcoin proof of work mining they've demonized, it's uh, chaos, farting. They're trying to uh, push people into all this plant based, uh, you know, eat the bugs, live in your pod kind of lifestyle. They're trying yeah. to, they're also behind all this carbon tracking uh, MasterCard business. Um, so yeah, it's it's there's some really strange connections there when we start talking about Greenpeace and Ripple, but it's all an attack on the energy use. Cool. Just before we uh, veer too far away with this, maybe about five or six weeks ago, the World Economic Forum put out a video where they're advertising that data centers were good for the environment. They're using excess energy. 
the company that they showed the footage of was a Bitcoin mining facility. So they didn't directly, the World Economic Forum did not directly say that this was a Bitcoin mining operation. They just said these data centers, they can move them around, they're really good. But to me, it sort of seems like they slowly want to change their tune and be pro proof of work, pro data centers, pro mining. But because they've had such a stance against Bitcoin for the last couple of years, I think they need to do it really slowly to be able to save face because we are losing, I think, globally a lot of res disrespect or we're losing respect for these institutions. Um, I, I'd like to know what your thoughts are in regards to that. It's funny, I uh, saw that video. Uh, it was a video of Crusoe Energy. Uh, like he's correctly stated, it's a Bitcoin mining uh, company. Uh, I, I did a video called the uh, the World Economic Forum's Secret Bitcoin Backflip because that was my uh, e exact interpretation of that video. It's really strange. They did a two minute video talking about how Bitcoin is good for the environment. It captures all of this flared gas and it transmits, uh, it, it transfers that uh, captured energy into data, centage, uh, data center energy. Uh, energy but it doesn't say it's for bitcoin mining which is what it's for and uh, so yeah like i love to speculate and i think it is the beginning of a uh, backflip on bitcoin the propaganda they put out has been so wrong for so many years and i think they're gonna have to like you say slowly uh kind of do the backflip on bitcoin because obviously since 2017 they've been bashing it in 2017 they put out a viral tweet uh, that's called viral for all the wrong reasons where they said by 2020 Bitcoin will use the entire world's energy and it's 2023 and Bitcoin uses 0.1%. With uh, BlackRock, they've obviously now come out and they're putting out a spot Bitcoin ETF. And I think with the, the Greenpeace, the World Economic Forum, BlackRock, they all know each other. They all talk to each other. So why do you think BlackRock has done this about phase where they've been so bearish against it? They used to say that Bitcoin was only use case was for money laundering. Is it just that they can see that people want it and they can make money from it and it comes down to greed? Or is this a step for us to go towards a Bitcoin standard globally? Because these BlackRock in particular and these large companies, these are the asset managers, the institutions that truly run the world, in my opinion. I will keep the tinfoil hat to the side for the moment, but uh, some people will uh, say that they're simply responding to customer demand. So people are saying, hey, I want to buy Bitcoin. BlackRock, you're the world's largest asset manager. Give me access to Bitcoin or I'm going to go elsewhere. So that's the simplest explanation. Uh, there could be, you know, explanation uh, uh, number two is a little bit more of an interesting one where I like to strap the tinfoil hat on. And some people say, hey, maybe this could be how Bitcoin gets attacked. So there's a really interesting wording uh, in the BlackRock ETF filing. It was actually hidden in page 24. And BlackRock was talking about the possibility of a hard fork happening in Bitcoin. And that's normal. It's fine to disclose, hey, there could be a hard fork. But what's really interesting is what they proposed they could do in the event of a hard fork. They actually said they're under no obligation to actually follow the chain or the fork of Bitcoin that is the most economically valuable, which is really strange because uh, if you are an asset manager responsible for making people money, you would think you'd choose the most economic chain. The only explanation for why you wouldn't is because you're attacking Bitcoin. And this is kind of where I kind of connected the dots in a recent video saying, look, you know, uh, maybe this is where uh, a government entity uh, or a uh, large asset manager in the world is going to try to force Bitcoin into two different chains. So one that is uh, obviously the real Bitcoin. And then there's chain number two, which is the BlackRock eco-friendly green chain that all of the KYC data is given up to access funds. And, you know, all of the, there's no self-hosted wallets as they call private wallets. And, uh, you know, so I think that's some really interesting wording that was hidden within the BlackRock ETF filing. And I did a video looking at BlackRock's secret attack on Bitcoin and speculated, hey, this could potentially be an attack. This is really strange wording. So there's lots of different explanations there for the BlackRock uh, Bitcoin ETF. And, you know, it could just simply be the beginning of hyper Bitcoinization. Every asset manager in the world is going to have to buy it one day. Yep. I, I find it very interesting why they bothered to put that wording in. Like it was very intentionally put in there. It wasn't just they copied and pasted and it ended up there for no reason. So it will be again in hindsight, it'll be something interesting to look back on. 
I guess with people like MicroStrategy that are holding such a large amount of Bitcoin, what are your thoughts for everyone that's holding real Bitcoin now? If the tinfoil hat conspiracy was to play out and they forked it and they went with the fake Bitcoin, what would happen to the real Bitcoin and for those real Bitcoin holders? I know it's all hypothetical. Uh, you get a lot richer. Because when these idiots try to split the chain, uh, you actually get, uh, you, you essentially get double the stack. So, but you only get that if you're self custodying your Bitcoin. So if you have Bitcoin sitting on exchange, uh, you don't get the benefits of any potential hard fork in the future. And again, I don't think a hard fork is likely, likely to happen tomorrow or six months or even in 12 months. I think if this is hypothetical attack scenario plays out, it's probably a year or two away. Um, but I would just tell everyone, uh, all of this is noise if you're self custody in your Bitcoin. Yeah, definitely. And with uh, self custody, are you using, maybe don't go into what, what device or, or the way that you're using it, but are you using a Bitcoin only product or are you using a product that allows you to put other things like crypto on there as well? So I have many things. Uh, I am a reformed crypto trader. So I did a lot of uh, crypto trading back in 2017, 18, and even maybe early uh, 2019 bef before uh, becoming a maximalist. So I have all sorts of different uh, storage setups. I have all sorts of different wallets. Um, I think the recent ledger leak kind of shows uh, the importance of picking a Bitcoin only uh, wallet though. Uh, so yeah, I would encourage people to learn more about self-custody. Um, I was an absolute technical dumbass before Bitcoin and now I'm, uh, I set up my own sophisticated uh, Bitcoin multi-sig uh, setup. So uh, Bitcoin custody is easier than you think. It might be intimidating to begin with, but there is an endless supply of tutorials to teach you how to take custody of your Bitcoin. Absolutely. If somebody wants to become a Bitcoiner, and like a true Bitcoiner and hold self-custody, be self-sovereign, all it takes is two to five hours to be able to learn how to hold possession from that. And then once you learn, it's like riding a bike, like you're never going to be able to forget to do it. Maybe the technology, the device you're using is a little bit different, but it's like a half hour or an hour video. And then you hold that bare asset. So if something like BlackRock's ETF happens, it doesn't matter. You're all good. So I think that's good. Uh, if you'd like to indulge me, I'm also a former um, crypto, uh, I think gambling's probably the best word, uh, trader, um, I, I guess. What's the difference? Because once you become a Bitcoin maximalist, I'd say I'm 100% a Bitcoin maximalist now. Once you become a Bitcoin maximalist, it's always Bitcoin is not crypto. Crypto is not Bitcoin. Do you see any value within crypto at all? And if so, where is that value? Um, or is it a, a lie that's being sold to people to be able to take their Bitcoin? What's your thoughts now after going through the market trading, either making money or losing money and then going full Bitcoin? Yes, I made a lot of money trading shit coins, um, but I was kind of, even the whole time I was doing it, uh, I kind of understood the fact that uh, Bitcoin was the only thing that could not be shut down by governments and altcoins are all essentially quasi forms of governments. They are all forms of proof of stake. So what is the problem Bitcoin fixed? Let's zoom right out. We have 5,000 years of monetary history. The entire history of monetary history is dominated by gold. Gold was the premier store of value because it was proof of work based. You kind of backed. You couldn't just inflate the supply of gold artificially because you had to put work into it. Um, so I believe the problem we're suffering from over the past 50 or 100 years of this fiat era is we're living in this proof of stake era. So I just think every crypto, every altcoin is just another version of digital fiat. It's just a version of Vitalik gets to pre-mine himself 70% of the Ethereum tokens and, you know, make the votes and makes the changes that he wants to change. Like uh, Ethereum is the, uh, you know, it's the, uh, the crypto industry standard, uh, most decentralized coin behind Bitcoin. But they've changed the rules eight times in a short six or seven year history. So I just yeah. think I, I keep it really simple. Bitcoin's the only thing that can't be changed by governments and never had its rules changed in 14 years. Crypto just continues to have its rules change and can, people can be politically swayed like we see in the traditional system. Yeah, awesome. I've got very uh, similar thoughts on it. I, I guess my message for the listeners, because I've got a bit of a split audience, is 
use the crypto to be able to make more Bitcoin. Don't get attached to the crypto. And there's some good narratives out there. Do the projects work or not? They're tiny little startups you're funding. Uh, There's very little gatekeepers, so it's easy to get into there. If you want to do that, just allocate your risk accordingly. Just have a small um, allocation if you are going to go out there and don't be silly with leverage. Let's uh, flip back to to Bitcoin. That's why we're here. Uh, You describe it as exponential technology. Do you want to dive into that for us, Luke? Yeah, so this is why I even discourage people from uh, trying to uh, gamble in altcoins because uh, the upside in Bitcoin is so big. Like Bitcoin has a total addressable market cap of $900 trillion. Even if I'm being very generous and, you know, I'm trying to envision a future where crypto uh, has any sort of use case in the future and we're, you know, tokenizing assets and uh, let's let's ignore the Oracle problem and let's assume that we can tokenize assets without trust, which we can't. But let's assume that we have that hypothetical utopian world. I cannot paint a picture for crypto or any crypto asset to have a total addressable market cap bigger than $5 trillion. And that's me being very generous, very conservative. Uh, Technology is, uh, it's a race to zero, okay? Uh, Entrepreneurs are going to uh, essentially uh, innovate things away to the marginal cost of production. So that being zero. Um, So, and I believe like Bitcoin has the largest total addressable market cap in history. $900 $900 trillion. You don't need to risk or gamble anything. You have the best self-custody solutions in the space. All you need to do is take your Bitcoin off exchange, store it in self-custody. You don't need to jump on these DGEN, MetaMask, uh, Uniswap exchanges where you don't hold the coins and you're, you know, trying to chase chase yield and chase uh, chase uh, chase returns. I think that's the biggest misunderstanding when it comes to uh, Bitcoin's uh, exponentiality. Uh, um, a lot of people think that uh, all of the returns of Bitcoin are gone and we're late to Bitcoin, when in reality, Bitcoin is still like 0.01% of the world's assets. And well, we haven't even seen BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, dip their toe into the pond of Bitcoin yet. So I think all of the upside uh, is actually in the future for Bitcoin. And I think the highest percentage of returns are in the future. And despite contrary uh, or commonly held opinions, I believe Bitcoin is only going to get more volatile from here. Yeah, yeah, I see that happening as well. I believe also like the volatility is going to increase with Bitcoin without a doubt. We're probably going to see, we already see thousands of dollar moves a, a day, even in the bear market. The other day is $800 move just on an average day, you know, um, and it ended up pretty sideways. So that volatility is going to increase when they come in. But I think all the risk is behind us. We can see that it's just TikTok next block you know it just keeps working and working and working it never stops doing what it's been designed to do and so people associate risk with volatility i think volatility is just a feature of it until we have like an exponentially large market cap with bitcoin i don't know what that needs to be if it's in the hundreds of trillions before that volatility drops down but what i mean by saying that with there's no more risk left with Bitcoin. We've got large companies adopting it, large countries adopting it. If we have the largest asset managers in the world adopting it, we're going to get the mainstream banks to be able to adopt it. Everyone's super funds naturally going to adopt it. And I think it then becomes risky not to have exposure in whatever way it is um, there. So that's the way that I uh, think about it. If... Um, you're always willing to go a little bit uh, deep, Luke. So I'd like to know what your thoughts are, like the Bank of International Settlements, the World Economic Forum, the IMF. They're all private corporations, basically. Are they trying to do good for the world or are they trying to have control and do good for themselves? Is there a bit of both? What would be your thoughts? Yeah, so I try not to ascribe malice uh, to situations where, you know, you don't have to, where you can kind of explain things simply. But I just think there's too many uh, red flags surrounding the World World Economic Forum and the BIS and the IMF uh, to actually, uh, you know, not not ascribe malice to what they're doing. Uh, Alex Gladstein has done some phenomenal work looking into the 
the history of the IMF and how they enslave uh, these modern countries uh, with uh, with essential uh, with essentially debt just to uh, extract their natural resources uh, from them. I mean, I can give your listeners a really quick example of what happened in Argentina recently. Uh, the IMF went into Argentina and they said, "Look, we're going to give you a forty five billion dollar loan, but you have to discourage the use of Bitcoin and crypto." So that means no stable coins or no Bitcoin in Argentina. And Argentina obviously agreed. And that essentially means that uh, the Argentinian government and the IMF is forcing the Argentinians to use a currency that is suffering from 150% inflation. So that means your life savings is uh, halving every three months. Uh, So I think that's pretty malicious. How dare the people of Argentina use a stable coin uh, or Bitcoin to actually protect their wealth? The IMF wants you to use a currency that's literally stealing from you. Uh, So I I do think they're pretty nefarious and pretty malicious. Uh, All of the uh, three letter, uh, you know, alphabet soup organizations around the world who think they run it. I was thinking about this morning, so I labelled like the World Economic Forum, Bank of International Settlements, but it's the World Health Organization, even the the Fed, you know, anything starting with three letters, I feel we need to be aware of and watch. And I'm surprised that Greenpeace is now not a three letter organization of <laughs> after last week. One other thing with the IMF, and I believe I'm correct in this, is if a country gets a loan from the IMF, they're not allowed to back their currency by gold ever as well. That's baked into that contract. They're the same as like using no Bitcoin or no crypto, no stable coins. I think that's absolute insanity um, that you can't go to before Bitcoin gold and now you can't go to Bitcoin. They're, they're trying to take away the, the power of security. Um, I think that's a very insidious thing. So... Um, Luke, for everyone watching, what message would you pass on to the viewers, maybe in regards to where should they direct their attention? What should they not get caught up in with the noise that's going on? And what should they really pay attention to at the moment in the state of Bitcoin, crypto, the world, the world economy, macro? Yeah, so I think we're actually living in the most interesting time in human history. Uh, we are watching uh, the financial system implode. We're at the end of an 80 year long term debt cycle. And we're also at the end of many other cycles. So we're in the very final chapter of a 90 year fourth turning, uh, which is like a generational cycle that explains why we see crises every 90 years. So if you look back 90 years ago, you had the Great Depression and Hitler and Mussolini uh, and, and obviously World War II. 90 years before then, you got the American Civil War in the 1860s. 90 years before then, you got the two revolutions in America and France in the 1770s. So you got the debt cycle, uh, fourth turning cycle. For the first time in history, we're transitioning away from industrial societies to information societies. Uh, we're also at the end of a 250-year revolutionary cycle. So I think the world is changing more than it has ever changed before in human history. All of these cycles we're living through are converging and if you want to actually take advantage of uh, what is going on around the world you just begin starting at the bitcoin rabbit hole the more you learn about bitcoin the more you're going to learn about the world i first only came to bitcoin in 2017 to make money and just get paper rich and then you start to understand hey hang on a minute so the reason bitcoin goes up in price is because the government is lying um, about us uh, in, form, in, in the way that we use money. So the government is lying to us about money, and then you're going to find all of these other rabbit holes. So the government is lying to us about the food. They're poisoning us with seed oils and trying to blame it on saturated fats like uh, red meat. They're trying to say that cows are killing the planet, which is also completely yeah. false. Um, and then obviously you also learn that the government is lying to you about uh, big pharma and medicine and uh, education. And I, I would just encourage the list if you're at least interested by Bitcoin, go a little bit further down that rabbit hole because you're going to have your eyes woken up to how the whole world really is. Um, So uh, my message to the listener is uh, there is no uh, wrong allocation to Bitcoin. The only, you know, wrong allocation is zero. You need to get off zero and have a little bit of Bitcoin um, and change uh, your allocation when your probabilities of different events change. And just, you know, uh, stay cautious out there. We're living in the 
you know, the biggest uh, attack and assault on freedom and sovereignty uh, since the 1940s, uh, when I'm not even going to get into what happened in Germany, but most people will know. I think what happened in 2020 uh, set very scary precedences. Um, I left Australia forever in 2022, as soon as the international borders opened up, because the Australian government was building, quote unquote, quarantine camps 100 miles from my home. And uh, with a medical status of my my own, I was uh, not going to take a risk staying in, in Australia any longer. So <laughs> yeah, get off zero and uh, just begin learning a little bit more about Bitcoin, just in case it catches on, as uh, Satoshi said. Yeah, I, what an amazing way to be able to sum it up. For everyone, uh, Luke, you had an amazing podcast with Dale Warburton, so where you really d dived into the nine to five escape artists. So I'll put that below. For everyone else watching that's made it this far, you're obviously a very deep thinker. So my message to the viewer there would be to study Bitcoin in whatever form it is. Safe Dean and Moose, the Bitcoin Standards, a great book. A couple of books coming out shortly. I'm being summoned. Um, but Bitcoin Evangelism as well is a fantastic book that I've just finished. So I'd recommend any books that you can find on Bitcoin. Just start diving down there. But Luke, uh, where can people find you? And I'll, if you can list those and I'll put it in the description for everyone. Yeah, amazing. So thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute blast. I do talk a little bit more about my uh, digital nomad uh, happenings and uh, events that I've seen over the past couple of years with Dale. So that video is a little bit more focused on the travel side of uh, what I'm doing. Uh, but essentially, you'll find me online talking shit about Bitcoin. Um, so I'm uh, writing for a number of different Bitcoin only companies. Um, I am the face uh, of the Coin Beast uh, Money Matters YouTube channel. So we're doing weekly videos over there where we're educating people about Bitcoin. Um, and I'm on Twitter. So if you want to tell me I'm crazy, or if you want to tell me uh, why $65 million Bitcoin is impossible, uh, leave me some comments in, in obviously the comments of this YouTube video, but also come and send me your hate mail on Twitter. You can find me there. Awesome. No, thank you so much. I've got two dogs jumping up on me. Mate, that was so much fun. I uh, look forward to doing it again. Thanks so much. And for everyone, hit subscribe. We'll see you on the next video. Be blessed. Peace.